the anger for what had become of the temple of his father's house, the house of prayer for all the nations. The greatest monotheistic religion in the world at the highest of its holy days, Passover, was little more than carnal, carnally, barely religious marketplace. Conviction regarding personal sinfulness had been replaced by convenience regarding animal sacrifice. The people were no longer looking for that prophet whom Moses had spoken of in messianic tones and were now interested in profiting from Passover. From a distance, on the outside, Judea Judaism looked like a thriving community committed to the true and living God. But a closer look revealed that first century Judaism was very much like a leafy but barren fig tree. I want us to see for the next few minutes from this text just a few observations. A fruitless search for nourishment, verses 12 to 14. Jesus condemns the condition of Judaism, verses 15 to 17. A murderous response to the giver of life, verses 18 and 19. And then verse 20 to 21, the judicial result of fruitlessness. Let's look at this, this fruitless search for nourishment. We're told that on the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. We had fig trees in the backyard where I grew up. I loved those figs. My brother and I would go and climb in the tree and try to beat the birds. Uh, to the, they had a tendency to eat the figs when they were almost ripe. And we liked to wait until they were ripe. So there was two windows there was, or on either side. You either, you either got to them when they were just right and rescued them from the birds, or you let them get overripe and they'd fall to the ground. But when you caught them in that sweet spot, they were delicious. And then, of course, my mom and dad had to fight us because they liked to can a few figs. And they would have to race us out there and get some and harvest them and put them in the canning process. A very leafy tree, big, big leaves on the fig tree. And so you would have to approach it to really see the full extent of the fruit on it. R.C. Sproul tells of a time when he was in seminary that one of his seminary professors uh, who was in his mid-80s at the time, was one of the most distinguished archaeologists of the 20th century. He says he was also perhaps the greatest living expert on uh, customs of the ancient Near East. So when he was teaching him about this text in Mark's Gospel, he explained that in, in Palestine there is a clearly defined season for figs, and a vast majority of fig species bear fruit within that season. But he also taught them that there was, there were, a few rare species of figs, of fig trees, that would bear fruit outside the normal season. The test of whether one could expect figs from a fig tree was not the time of year because of these two realities, but whether the foliage of the tree was in full bloom. Jesus approached this tree. It was in full bloom. We're told it was full of leaves, very leafy. Was it not a fruit-bearing time, it would not have had leaves. And I remember that well also. That the leaves would fall, we had to rake them up, they made a mess. And then when they start putting out leaves the next season, you would look for figs. And what you have here in this fig tree is a powerful symbol of Judaism. Judaism was a monotheistic religion. That is, it was a religion that taught one God, whereas all around them taught many gods false gods. Judaism was all about the one true and living God, the covenant-keeping God, Jehovah. Elohim, the creator, Jehovah, the God who had his everlasting love for his people. So Judaism stood out, was different than the rest of the nations around it. It was supposed to be. And this fig tree stands out of season, we're told in the text it was not the season to bear figs. This is one of those fig trees that would bear figs out of season because it was that rare species. And you should have fully expected a leaf-bearing fig tree to have figs on it. Yet it had none. 
And what a powerful image this becomes of Judaism. Judaism looked from a distance like a thriving community of committed followers of Jehovah. They had their festivals. They had their sacrificial times. They had their, their journeys, their pilgrimages. Paul says in Romans, to you was given the law. To you was given the prophecies. To you was given the, the covenants. All these items that should have betokened life in Judaism. But Judaism was a leafy, barren fig tree. And so the backdrop of Jesus' encounter with this fig tree is really a, a foreshadowing of his assessment he's going to give when he comes into Jerusalem. This time not with great fanfare, but coming on a mission. We told you last week he came into the temple in the evening. There would not have been many people there. He was looking around. He surveyed the temple. And he left. And he comes back now in the full uh, brightness of day at the busiest time. You see, Judaism was led by hypocrites, by legalists. The word hypocrite, by the way, we've told you this before. Uh, when it comes to us in the New Testament, it's, it's a Greek word, hypocrates. And Hippocrates simply means to put on a mask. It was, the, it was a word from the Greek stage play of the day. The, the comedies, you would have a, a, an actor with a mask with an over-exaggerated smile. That was a happy face. Be an actor with a mask with an over-exaggerated frown. Uh, those were the tragedies. And they operated a mask. And so, so Judaism was led by people that Jesus likened to this. In fact, two people portions of Matthew 23. I want to read quickly to you. Matthew 23, 25, and 26, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, then the outside also may be clean. Karen and I visited a mother and her daughter, they were precious, precious people. Years and years ago, they had more cats than a person could count. And we went in the house and, to visit them. And they had been our nursery matrons when we were little in the nursery together. And they offered us coffee or tea, I forget. Now, the place was a wreck. But these were dear ladies. I was not about to turn them down for an offer of coffee or tea. So we took the cup and we drank. And when we got down to the bottom of it, I don't know what was in that cup. It was awful. I don't know if it was a failed attempt at cleaning or whether they just hadn't bothered to clean it at all. And with all the cats around, I wondered what had been in it before it was used to serve me my beverage. And it totally changed my attitude toward what I had just consumed. Jesus uses that image for the Pharisees. Oh, you look, your, your cups look all clean on the outside, but they're filthy on the inside. Another way he described them later on in verses 27 28 was, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The keepers of the law, lawless. The purveyors of Judaism, hypocrites. That's what Judaism had become. And so we see this condemnation he pronounces in verses 15 to 17. He came to Jerusalem, entered the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons wouldn't allow anyone to carry anything through the temple and began teaching them, which means he was saying this over and over. Is it not written, my house? Now he is quoting scripture, but he's taking it to himself. He is identifying the temple as his place. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. You see, the Herodian temple was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was a huge complex divided into four parts. 
the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, the court of the Jews, and the Holy of Holies. And they were moving inward. The court of the Gentiles was the largest part of the complex. It included a place for Gentiles to congregate because God had called Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people, to be a blessing to all the nations. Remember, he told him that he would be a tree and the birds of all from all the earth could take refuge in the tree. But you see, the core of the Gentiles on the outer edges of the temple complex was the area where Jesus is making his observation. When Solomon built the temple previously, he's dedicating it in 1 Kings 8, 41 to 43, and he says, Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel, that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. The intentional expression in Solomon's dedication with the understanding that the Gentiles would come to the temple, that they would gather there as they heard of the great name and awesome deeds of God. But see, the problem is the Jews hated the Gentiles. And they had hoped that when Messiah came, he would cleanse the temple of all Gentiles and get rid of them once for all. And that was their great misunderstanding. You see, Jesus recognized it was to be a house of prayer for all the nations, praying for all the people groups to come to the Lord. The Jews had hoped that Messiah would cleanse the temple of Gentiles, but Jesus cleansed the temple for the Gentiles. It was to be a place for people not for sheep and goats, not for commercialism. We looked at this last Sunday night as we're studying through following Jesus day by day. His, the first cleansing of the temple as he, as he comes, manifests himself in the early chapters of John's Gospel. This is now the second time he's done this. Now it's toward the end of his ministry. It will provoke a murderous response. Remember, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. If chronologically you put this together. So listen to the response of the Jewish leaders. Is there any question when you see this response that they were exactly as he described them? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, heard what he was doing, and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Rather than being awed, by his capacity to raise from the dead one who had been dead more than three days by the time he arrived, which in Jewish thinking meant the soul was no longer even hovering over the body. Rather than be amazed by one with that power, rather than take to heart what he had said when he cited the scriptures, they were inflamed with his arrogance, his presumption. They feared that the people would follow him. And they determined to do something about it. And of course, we know chronologically, historically, this set in motion the plan to arrest him, torture him, crucify him in just a few days from here. How interesting. Those charged with portraying the God of life would spend their time plotting to take a life of someone the people called rabbi. It's the irony here that is so thick. You see, it happens today, folks. Sometimes the advance of Christianity is so radical, so unanticipated, moving in so strange a way that religion presents it. Because religion can't contain it. And religious people, people who are simply religious, will try to, to, to wrestle it in to check it. Yet you can't do that to the gospel. Not successfully. It's been tried and you will look and see. If you look back, you will see denomination after denomination that's on the trash heap of denominations because they thought they knew better than the gospel of Jesus Christ. They thought they could, could add to it. They thought they could tone it down. They thought they could diminish it. They thought they could make it more palatable. 
And you have this encounter here in the temple, which is a powerful reminder to us today that we must always find ourselves on the side of the gospel and never settle for just traditional religion. It is killing. It is deadly. So here's the judicial result of fruitlessness. The next morning they were going out and they passed by the, the tree. It was withered. Peter said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. He taught in John 15. A portion of scripture we call the, the portion of the, about the vine and the branches. Listen to verses 1 to 6. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, that is the Father, takes away. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. We just celebrated the Lord's Supper together by taking the, the, the piece of, little piece of bread, by taking the cup of juice and consuming it. We said, we're abiding in Christ and He is abiding in us. We have union and communion with Christ. We are one with Him. He is our all in all. If that's not being fleshed out in our lives, not perfectly now, but intentionally, Predominantly, then we are found hypocrites. Listen to what he says. Verse 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Judaism was a withered fig tree. Its days were numbered. Soon no one would ever gather anything fruitful from Judaism. Because Jesus had come. Better than anything they could promote. Better than the law. He was the law walking. Better than the prophets. He was that prophet. Better than the priests. He was the high priest who would not only make the sacrifice, but the high priest who would be the sacrifice. He was their king. Even though they would say in the most pitiful moment that we'll see very soon, we have no king but Caesar. He was their king. He was better than anything they had that was of benefit to them in Judaism. And yet they missed it. They missed it. And they missed it to their great peril. And folks, if we miss Jesus Christ, you know, we can, we can build a building, we can put a steeple on it, give ourselves a name put together a lot of programs do a lot of things be really busy and miss Christ and we do so to our own peril to our own detriment the simplicity of Christ you see you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things these, these things are added But he's the focus. A Savior who lived perfectly, never sinned, never broke the law. My friend Fred Malone, Pastor Heaven, said Jesus was the law walking. In fact, he said the gospel can be summed up this way God the lawgiver sent Christ the law keeper to die for lawbreakers. He never sinned. In the fullness of time, he took that, that active righteousness of sinless living and willingly submitted himself to the painful and shameful death of the cross. Dying in our place. Bearing in his body our sin on the tree. Offering himself to God. Satisfying God's divine justice by suffering and dying in our place. Paul says in Romans, he did this. God set him forth and displayed him as a propitiation, that is a wrath-bearing sacrifice, 
a wrath-appeasing sacrifice so that God might maintain His holy justice and justify, declare not guilty all who would come by faith in Christ to God. If we miss Christ, we miss everything. And these people who so desperately want to see the Messiah come missed the Messiah. Religion bogged them down. Religion blinded them. Are you in Christ today? That's my question to you. Didn't ask you if you're a member of a church. Are you in Christ today? Have you come consciously to a point in your life where you confessed your sins, that you were a sinner deserving of nothing but hell and the eternal wrath of God? And yet in confessing that, you did so because you saw that God had given Jesus Christ as a Savior of sinners, the only Savior of sinners. And that everything we read in the Scripture tells us He's the willing Savior of sinners. And you confessed your sin and confessed your need of Christ and faith in Him and who He was when He lived and what He did on that cross and how He came out of the grave three days later infallibly proving and declaring that He is the way to heaven, the only way to heaven. Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Are you trusting Jesus Christ in Him alone? If you are, welcome. God bless you. You're marching on to Zion. You're coming to that, to that river that has no bridge. That we'll cross over into Beulah land. You're coming. But oh, if you have not, if somewhere along the way you've settled for something less, you've, you've settled for membership, you settled for baptism, you settled for, for simply participating, you, you settled for something less. Oh, today, today, don't miss Jesus Christ. You see His attitude. Every tree, it's interesting in John, John 15, everybody gets cut. The fruitless get cut down. The genuine fruitful get pruned to be more fruitful. Everybody gets cut. But oh, you don't want to be one of those plants in the end where the axe is laid to the root and you're thrown into the fire. You don't want to be that. You want to be a fruit-bearing plant uh, that through the Spirit that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Be bearing the fruit. Being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, Paul says in Romans 8. Is that you today? Not perfectly. None of us do this perfectly. But oh, predominantly, repentingly, Becoming more and more like Christ. That He is more and more altogether lovely to you. That He was the day that He found you. Are you Jesus Christ today? Is He yours? I pray that He is. But if He is not, oh, today, Josh saying, come to the altar. The altar is Jesus Christ. <laughs> and He is right there where you are. And right where you are, you can, you can call out to Him. You can confess your sins and say, Oh, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And He will have mercy. He always does. He will have mercy. Don't be a lesson in hypocrisy. Don't be something just full of leaves. Just religious trappings but no fruit. Let's pray. Again, we bow, Holy Father. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, oh, this passage is piercing. The people identified as the most religious, the most fastidious, the most energetic, Concerning Judaism, you, through your Son, called hypocrites. Oh, Father, 
Help us here to be all we should be that this place will be a place of prayer for all the nations. Forgive us when we're willing to engage in carnal pursuits have little to do with pursuing holiness. And make of us a people who are growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are becoming more and more like Jesus, who are bearing the fruit of the Spirit as evidence that the Spirit has dwelling in our lives. And Lord, for those here today who have not yet come to know Christ, I pray that today they would call out to Him and be saved, changed and transformed forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me as we...